My um, old friends and new in the greens of Aotearoa and New Zealand, um, I would first uh, bring from across the ditch uh, again our condolences for the uh, tragedies which this country has had in uh, recent months. Uh, of course, um, in particular, the enormous destruction and loss of life in, in Christchurch. And um, we wish you uh, all the best in uh, the recovery of that great city and uh, this country into a future which is full of promise, as is our own country, in a world that's uh, got its problems, but where we are destined, if we have the courage and the confidence, to be world leaders in a, a, a century in which um, our human community faces unprecedented problems uh, which will be sorted out through one of two options, democracy or guns. And uh, we Greens, uh, as all other political parties in this country and my own, committed to democracy. We share uh, the uh, old, we're amongst the oldest continuous democracies on earth and it is our uh, wish as Greens to reinvigorate the democracy, the democratic system to ensure that people and their future uh, are uh, the benefactors of the debates which take place in parliaments. Uh, but which very often are confined to the terms of those parliaments rather than looking to the future. And if there's one difference between the Greens and the other political parties, and uh, I'm standing here addressing uh, the, this forum of the oldest national Greens party on the planet, the New Zealand Greens. <laughs> If there's one difference uh, between the Greens and the older parties uh, and other parties, it's this. We think through the lens of those who come after us. Our, our pursuit uh, in decision making is one of will people 50 or 100 or 500 years from now thank us for doing this. And if you can't say yes to that, you ought not be doing it. But it is transformative in politics which is so often myopic, short term, based on greed and self-interest now, rather than the long-term interests of our country, um, our own kith and kin coming down the line, indeed our fellow creatures on this planet, and ultimately the planet itself. Because we are, so far as we know, on the one little speck of green in the whole of the universe, which has life, and through we human beings, uh, the ability to reflect upon itself and change itself. This is a, uh, an extraordinary piece of uh, existence for us, and the challenge is with us. The onus is ours. It is our responsibility. The fate of this planet is our responsibility. And at the moment, uh, we, ha we are in uh, great, uh, we are facing great difficulties. When I came onto the planet in 1944, there were two and a half billion people. In these coming months of this year, there will be seven billion people. By the time uh, many of you in this audience are my age, there will be nine or 10 billion people. And all of them aspiring to consume resources, to have the material wealth that we in New Zealand and Australia have now. Now, if you do a back of envelope calculation, that means we need the resources uh, equivalent to three planets, Earth. It cannot happen. There is a uh, immediate and remarkable challenge to us human beings to pull in our belts, to be able to enjoy life through knowing that we are living within the means of this planet, a planet in which already we human beings are using 120% of the living resources year by year, and that percentage is growing. 
You don't have to be a mathematician to know that that is an extraordinary challenge to us all. And what we Greens are about is facing up to the reality, not the theory, but the reality of the circumstances in which we live and through using our God-given intelligence, being able to, uh, through policy, give a hand over to the next generation this single thing, security. Security through uh, the use of common sense and through uh, taking a exemplar's role in a world where other people are more poverty stricken, more crowded, less resources, have a great, great more, deal more difficulty working out a comfortable future destiny than we do uh, in New Zealand and Australia. Which brings me uh, to a news item I saw last night about the Kiwi. Uh, it's in strife. The numbers are falling. This great national icon, which uh, is used as a friendly appellation uh, for uh, people around the world, you know, the Kiwis, New Zealanders. But this little bird is the symbol of that, unique to this country. I'm uh, currently, <coughs> I have a, a Senate inquiry into the fate of our national icon in Australia, the koala. Two million were shot in 1927. It's now thought the total population is less than 100,000. It is faced with several uh, diseases. Its habitat is going. There's never been an inquiry into it before. And the question is, uh, why not? Well, because we don't want to face up to the expansion of cities, the growth of uh, tollways, the uh, open-cut coal mining. They've got a new one in Queensland, which has just been ticked off on. Listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, an open-cut coal mine at Wendowan, which will be, when it's uh, in its heyday coming down the line, in an age of carbon restraint, 11 kilometres across on prime farmland, which includes some koala habitat, just been ticked off by governments in Brisbane and Canberra. Um, the koala is in, is in real strife. The question is, are we prepared to stop it going to extinction through, prote through protecting its habitat? The answer in all likelihood is no, we're not very prepared to do that at all because it's going to get in the way of somebody's wish to transform the planet for a short-term profit. But uh, we are spiritual beings who relate to the planet. We've come out, we've been cradled for millions of years in the wild planet. Uh, that's why we put window boxes of flowers in front of, uh, uh, in our houses. It's why we put pictures of nature on our wall. And we cut ourselves off from our own bonding with uh, this beautiful planet of ours if we don't look after it. I like to tell the story of my friend David Suzuki from um, Canada. I was driving with him in T Tasmania the other year and he said, uh, talking about our inability as uh, a now highly economically motivated society to relate to the, to the planet which makes us, which nurtures us and upon which we entirely depend. It doesn't depend on us, we depend on it. And he said, I went, uh, you know, getting this idea that we are a mammal and a big herd of them and we're consuming at a great rate. I went to a supermarket uh, the other day, Bob, and it had a sign in the window saying, animals not allowed. So I, so I got in my car and drove to a place where I could shop. <laughs> and the Wendowan coal mine uh, in Australia, which is the biggest coal exporting country on earth by a country mile, reminds us of uh, or challenges us with uh, the idea that gro any growth is good uh, because what we do know is that the climate challenge, climate change, uh, I know you've just had in this neck of the woods one of the warmest springs ever. I read in this morning's paper here that uh, Britain has just had the warmest summer since records began in 1659, 
uh, we are recognising the planet is warming and it's um, a growth, it's accelerated warming, it's not just a gentle heating. Uh, it is, uh, there's fights now over resources uh, through the ability of ships to now traverse the Arctic, uh, where Governor Franklin, who named the Fra who, after whom the Franklin River in Tasmania was named because he was governor down there, was lost uh, simply because there was no passage. A bit more than uh, uh, a century and a half ago, is now, it's now melting. We uh, are looking at accelerated melting in Greenland of the tundra of the west of West Antarctica. We know that the sea level rises are 18 centimetres now above where they were, the sea level's 18 centimetres above where it was, but this is accelerating as well. Um, and the projection is for a metre sea level rise this century. But as Jeanette was uh, reminding me last night, the projection for two, two degree warming, which is seen to be the global target, is that uh, over a number of centuries that will lead to a 25 metres sea level rise. We can't afford that. And yet in Australia, the debate, when we, uh, with the government, and we're working uh, after the formation of minority government in August last year, I um, and my colleague, my deputy leader, Christine Milne, spoke with the government and we formed a cabinet subcommittee with two independents, Tony Windsor and Rob Oakshot, both from New South Wales. The opposition refused to take part to work out a carbon policy for the future. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that both the Labor Party and the Liberal National Coalition, now in opposition in Australia, campaigned to the last election saying there would be no action on climate change in this period of government, this three years. Because the Greens got the balance of power, there is action on climate change. That's the difference. And because, because the Greens got the balance of power, there will be action on climate change which means there will be enormous economic dividends for Australia. Because as Maggie Thatcher said two decades ago, every year we delay on action on climate change, it becomes more expensive to act on it. That is the economic reality. And yet there are huge forces against developing policy to tackle carbon emissions. And the carbon emissions, which, ca which count, are those coming from fossil fuels, basically oil and coal, being burnt uh, to transform into energy, uh, principally electricity. And in Australia, the challenge was to, firstly, uh, the Greens having achieved balance of power, with Adam Bant entering the lower house, the first uh, elected Green in a general election in Australia in a single member electorate system, and now nine uh, senators, four, my four uh, new fellow senators, will be joining our team in the Senate on July the 1st, uh, where we will hold balance of power in the Senate. The government and the opposition came to the Greens to discuss uh, forming government. One had 82 seats, one had 83 seats. They needed 85. They had to discuss with independents forming government. And uh, Julia Gillard was on the front foot right from the outset. Um, Tony Abbott, I met later in the week, uh, was making it clear that he would do anything to get into government. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a very much more earnest and uh, forthright uh, Julia Gillard that we elected to go with on the basis that there would be a, a climate change committee set up with uh, cabinet status, sub, subcommittee of cabinet status. That committee is now working through to a deadline of approximately the, the 1st of July. Uh, my colleague Christine Milne, who's the most knowledgeable uh, MP on climate change, the economy, the environment, the employment ramifications of policy on climate change, I submit in the Australian Parliament, will be again meeting the Minister for Energy, uh, Greg Combay, day after tomorrow. Uh, and uh, the issues are not yet sorted out. Um, there is great effort by the media 
and that's their job, to find out exactly what decisions we've made and to uh, publicise those decisions before we've made them, but we haven't made them. <laughs> and uh, there's yet critical components, like the price of carbon, uh, like a mechanism, it, we are moving towards a carbon levy on the thousand biggest polluters in Australia, not a tax on everybody, as uh, Leader of the Opposition Tony Abbott would have a great big new tax on everything. But uh, putting the price on the big polluters means that um, it will uh, flow through to consumers generally. The difference between the... Uh, I'm, I'm telling you as much as I know and can here, uh, I know it won't get reported back to Australia, so I'm feeling relaxed about this. <laughs> the difference between what Tony Abbott wants to do, which is to take taxpayers' money and give it to the big polluters to reduce their carbon emissions, and uh, the uh, Greens' Labor independence position is that we want to take money from the big polluters to tax them on their pollution and to give it to the rest of the economy uh, to help shelter them from that. Rutani, Rutani, it's, it's a very curious turnaround here, you see, because we've got the conservative opposition wanting a centralised process where you take money off taxpayers to get an outcome, and us uh, Greens and Labor taking a market decision where you, uh, you'll tax the uh, uh, polluters uh, to uh, help the, transform the rest of the economy but move to a trading scheme a little way down the line. Um, what, what will the carbon price be? That's yet to be settled. What will the, the uh, mechanism for moving from a carbon price across to a trading scheme that yet is, is to be settled, but we're working. Will petrol be in or out? Of the, the Greens uh, say yes. Uh, I think uh, other components of this discussion are inclined to say no. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're up. Not uh, we're not just here trying to design a system to to put a price on carbon to reduce carbon emissions and transform the economy to a clean, green future. But we're dealing with inbuilt subsidies to the big polluters. In Australia, in any given year, those who are, are burning fossil fuels are subsidised by the taxpayers $11 billion per annum. If you're a big coal company, and the majority of these are foreign owned, then uh, you are avoiding the 38 cents a litre on fuel that the average Australian, including small business, pays. You, pay the, you don't pay that tax. It's subsidised. It's returned to you by uh, governments that have come out of the majority Labor or coalition uh, system in the past, so open to lobbyists that ultimately it's the average Australian, and particularly small business, which has lost out there. The, um, the question is, how is this going to go? Well, um, it's going to be a pretty torrid affair. We, uh, have, uh, we will make this announcement if we reach agreement within the next month or so. Um, and we're up to it. We're prepared. You know, uh, we are 10 people in a parliament of 240. We are not... We have a sectional mandate. We got uh, 12 or 13 per cent of the vote uh, if you take the Senate into account at the last election. We are not dictators. We are negotiators. And it is our job as Greens, in this period of transition from being outside the parliament to being in it, who having a share of government, moving in the future to being governments, green governments, in this country and in our country, to utilising the a component of mandate we have responsibly, with economic nous, with an eye on a fair society, to turning around the growing gap between rich and poor, which is a recipe for instability, 
and to guaranteeing the basic rights of all citizens uh, to, ne to negotiate outcomes which are going to be good for the average Australian. Not just a, the green voter, but the average Australian. So we have a carbon negotiation taking place, a carbon price. We will, I believe, get a carbon price, but it won't be a green carbon price. This will not be a Green Party outcome. It will be a compromise outcome with the Labor government and the independents of the day. And uh, the, uh, the maturity that's required here, the responsibility to the nation, the ability to uh, give as well as take is uh, very much in demand, uh, particularly as it's being done under a hail of criticism from the opposition and the Murdoch media, which is so influential in Australia. And I have, um, in recent um, weeks, been very direct with the media about its own responsibility in terms of conveying fairly uh, what is going on in this debate and conveying fairly what the scientists are telling us about the need for achieving a climate price. But I would be remiss if I didn't say to you that uh, setting a carbon price, a tax if you like on the big polluters, with a transition to a trading scheme, if the rest of the world goes in that direction, and that's a if, is uh, on our way to tackling uh, much bigger climate problems and the reality of what climate change is, which has not yet seeped into the uh, editorial offices of uh, papers like The Australian, let alone into uh, the wider consciousness of uh, people who are thinking about the future in this country and around the world. Let me give you a few conservative scientific factors relating to Australia, and you can translate these to New Zealand. We uh, are likely to see the death of most of the barrier reef by mid-century. There are 47,000 people employed in coal mining in Australia, but there are 67,000 people employed by the Barrier Reef. The coal mining industry puts most of its profits out of the country. The Barrier Reef keeps most of its profits through small business in the country. And it makes us proud of being who we are. And it gives us a sense of beauty and fulfilment and delight about being alive in the world at the start of the 21st century. Not only uh, is the Barrier Reef's fate dependent on climate change, that is the warming of uh, waters, which are death to coral, if uh, it's not the historic ebb and flow of temperatures, but carbon going into the atmosphere is absorbed by water which forms carbonic acid and the oceans are becoming increasingly acid and we are already at the tipping point where coral cannot regenerate due, due to that acidification. So even if we stop the warming, the carbon in the atmosphere at the moment is increasingly acidifying the ocean with the consequent death of the Great Barrier Reef uh, on the agenda. The snowfields of Australia are rapidly being lost. According to Ross Garneau's first study, the Murray-Darling Basin, which is the great food producing region of Australia, may lose 90% of its productivity by the end of this century. That is within the lifetime of children at the moment, if climate change trajectories are not altered. This is on a planet where we're told in the last week the recent enormous food price rises, 20% of that food price rise is due to climate change already, climate change occurring at the moment. It is putting a cost onto everything we do. Tony Abbott doesn't get that. That 
already failure to act on climate change is costing everybody when they go to the shop to buy food. But that is the reality of 2011 and uh, the circumstances in which we exist. And if there is some crossover point between doing nothing about climate change because it costs money and acting on climate change to save the cost of climate change, I suspect we've already passed it. And what we're dealing with in Australia at the moment, we asked uh, to model, to get Treasury to model the cost of keeping the carbon going into the atmosphere, which is going to affect the entities I was just talking about, at 550 parts per million, or 450 parts per million, which we're told may keep warming at two degrees, ending up at 25 metre sea level rises. Or, 300, or the Greens wanted 350 parts per million, which we've already gone past, but we hopefully could get back to. They wouldn't model 350 parts per million. So we're de dealing with two scenarios, both of which are going to lead inevitably to catastrophic impacts on the economy, the lifestyle, the security, uh, and just the fragile beauty of this planet as we know it. We're not even dealing with the option which may save us from that because they wouldn't model it in Australia. It's not on the agenda. So what we are looking at is the least worst of the two alternatives. Now the Copenhagen Agreement was basically at, at uh, 450 parts per million. Let's not go beyond two degrees warming. There's hardly a country on the face of the planet which has kept that commitment. Our question uh, as we're discussing this in the Climate Change Committee in Australia is uh, between 450 parts per million basically and 550 parts per million. We know that the coal industry is already setting up a barrage of advertising against whatever comes out. There will be a, a tour de force from the mining industry in Australia against any outcome, even the unsatisfactory one that I'm talking about. You may not know, but last year there was a Treasury recommendation in Australia because of the mining boom which has us beautifully placed amongst world economies, that a super profits tax be placed on those mines which were raising extraordinary profits in a period of boom and sale to China in particular. The Conservatives in Australia said no to that. The Labor Party, which is Conservative also in Australia, said no to that. It was left to the more responsible economic thinking of the third political party in Australia, the Greens, to back Treasury in gaining that tax. However, However, the miners came to town. They spent $28 million on an advertising campaign. The government collapsed over this. It even changed the Labor Party, changed its Prime Minister, who had supported this tax, from Kevin Rudd to uh, its new leader, Julia Gillard, who compromised with the mining industry. And that compromise, according to the best assessment we can get, means that there will be $100 billion less coming to government over the next decade. So I am aware, in talking about budgets, and we're discussing that in the Australian Parliament, that there will be, in future years, $10 billion missing for schools, hospitals, security, transport, no public transport funding at all in this year's budget, uh, and the environment, just to name a few, because of that single tour de force by the already rich and powerful on a body politic which you would think would be able to stand up to it in Canberra. And that brings into question the fourth estate, because the Murdoch media went into overdrive in attacking the potential for a full mining super profits tax as outlined by Treasury. 
Mr Abbott, the leader of the opposition, said no tax at all. He would take $145 billion out of the tax receipts for the next decade. And what are the miners making their money from? Well, they're making money from the people's ore resources. These are the property of the people, the general, the commonwealth, the people of Australia, not least indigenous Australians, for which uh, they make billions, much of it exported overseas as profit, while a hapless, weak, illogical and lacking in common sense, pure, plain, responsible common sense, big party system in Australia rolls over and uh, gives in to the right of our country to uphold its simple dictum of a fair go. That is left to the Greens. And we are a small party, but we believe in it and we will be working for it. We um, are very, uh, I might say, also a very happy group of people. It's a very curious thing <laughs> because we're the ones who've got our eyes open to what's happening in the world. We're open to the fact that we live on a planet in which one trillion dollars this year will be spent on armaments and making preparation for war. We live on a planet where if just 6 per cent, 60 billion of that money were diverted to looking after people in extreme poverty, then every child on the planet could be guaranteed food in her or his belly, clean water and a school to go to. That's what we should be aiming for rather than what we're doing at the moment. So I say this, I uh, have never been happier in my life than I am now. I was asked the other day at a press conference when I was having a bit of a tater tate with uh, some, uh, fellow, uh, some fellows in the uh, press, and you know, the press is so important, and, I, and I, uh, I'm very aware of the fourth estate and its importance in conveying, inf as Ralph Nader said to me uh, back in uh, 1980 during the Franklin campaign, he was quoting Jefferson, uh, information is the currency of democracy. So thank God we have a free pe press in our countries. But that means being able to, uh, you know, have a good discussion uh, <laughs> as well. Well, uh, this fellow who was getting something coming off a little the worse for a, a free discussion we were having at this press conference, which started about koalas and ended up on uh, when are you going to retire? <laughs> And I said, I've got a role model here. And they said, who? And I said, Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> he, he, just, he just turned 80 last month. Now I'll turn 80 in 2024, come back and ask me then and I'll be able to, <laughs> I'll be able to tell you where I'm going. <laughs> but that said, I've, I've only got to reconnect here in New Zealand with the Greens, to see that we are a young, vigorous, well thought out, forward thinking party like no other on the political scene. And it does the heart good. <laughs> Machiavelli said 600 years ago, if you want to change the world, get ready to be dropped on, I'm paraphrasing here, by those who already have the power and the money. Well, we're up to it because there's more important things than uh, those and that is feeling good about ourselves, feeling responsible and, and just uh, careful, carefully forward in our thinking uh, to make sure we're handing on this country, my own country, uh, in good, safe repair to those who come after us. We owe it to them in everything we do. I look at uh, the mix of faces with the Greens candidates I was talking with this morning. Uh, wonderful people. I congratulate you for the courage to stand with a Greens party. Uh, I look at the uh, confidence uh, with which this party can move to the election on November 26. 
I'm, uh, I feel good that the people of New Zealand, as in my own country, have such a, a sensible, well thought out, but very different set of policies to the big parties going to a national election, that there is a real, cohesive, common sense, economically literate and ecologically responsible and socially fair set of policies being given to people which won't be matched by any of the other political parties. Uh, being new sometimes brings its trials. Whenever I get uh, a little bit despondent about the attacks, I go and look at what happened to the suffragettes or the people who are going to change, uh, get rid of slavery or get children out of the mines and give them a, an education. In every case, those who were moving for these huge advances in civilization were condemned on economic grounds. <laughs> Every case. Uh, and uh, so in some ways I take it as a badge of honour that uh, the powers that be that don't want a fair economy, that don't want climate change which is the biggest threat to economic well-being right around the planet to be tackled because it might affect their profit line. Uh, it's a badge of honour to, to know that we've, we're just following from good company in the past. Let there be no mistake, we Greens are a global entity which is here to change the way the world is not working into a functioning, common sense, secure future. Uh, amongst this audience is the future well-being of this nation of New Zealand. And with uh, us, your compatriots across the Tasman, we take on our shoulders seriously our right and our responsibility as potential elected representatives in wealthy countries. If we can't do it, we can't ask people in poorer countries to do it for us to set a standard of global citizenship. That means in a, in a globally integrated world that, may, that will bring security to not only our own kith and uh, kin, but to this marvellous, wonderful planet on which we exist in 2011. None of the other parties can say that in the way that we do. None of them can follow through on their policies and guarantee future stability and security in the way we Greens can. I love being green. I love the common sense of it. I, I love the growing family of it around the world. So I congratulate you. I wish the rest of this conference uh, a great outcome. I'm very excited to be following your trajectory in the coming months. There's no doubt you'll be looking across to see how we go as well. Uh, and I just simply thank you for the time, the commitment, the intellectual rigour and honesty that uh, you Greens here in the, as I said, the world's first national Greens entity, you inheritors of that, are bringing to the political milieu of this great country as it moves to a next election where the Greens are more the premium alternative for Kiwi voters uh, than ever before and offer the best dividend to any voter in this country who doesn't like the direction the key government is going, who doesn't see excitement in the Labor alternative, but who can get good direction and excitement and a sense of fulfilment out of voting Green on November 26. I wish you all great success.